Hey fam, I'm Chesman Trollope, the lead pastor of Crossover City Church in South Africa, in Kimberley, the Diamond City. Thank you so much for tuning in to our YouTube channel. My heart's prayer is that whatever content is on our channel, that it may inspire you, that it may encourage you. And as our slogan at Crossover City Church says, we are crossing over, that you too may cross over from sickness to health, from unemployment to employment, from riches to glory, from blessings to blessings, and from strength to strength. Pray that everything that you may receive here may encourage you in who God has predestined you to be as you press forward. Further than that, enjoy and God bless you. Thank you. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been dealing with the subject of the wall of floor. And if we're looking at the subject, Pastor Laverno opened up the subject and he just preached a powerhouse message. How much of you guys enjoyed that message that Pastor V brought in the first? And we've been focusing on David, the house of David particularly. So the house of David is what we've been focusing on and this character that all of us know as David. Um, week two, Gavin came and he preached his very ser first sermon at Crossover City Church. Um, and he came and delivered this message, speaking about David as well. Last week, Pastor Denver came and he spoke about David and he shared about, but about David and his journey as well, just to show you how David was this great man. So I'm just going to give you guys a bit of background and we'll be moving ahead with the story and the house of David, just to show you, because if we're looking at this, um, and you guys have heard this over the last couple of weeks, David is most probably one of the most famous characters besides Jesus in the word people in the people who don't even come to church people who don't even serve god know the story of david that's how famous david is sermons about david is most probably being preached this very morning somewhere in the world by another church and everybody know what put david to fame i mean you hear about it from sports commentators when they say it's a david versus goliath battle happening right here so we see this thing of david play out everywhere because david is so known and so well known everywhere david when we look at the bible the bible speaks about the fact that david is a skilled musician that this guy understood the chords. He understood what to do when it came to certain chords. The Bible comes here and it reveals to us as well that David was a poet. When you read the Psalms, you see this guy being a poet and I don't even know if he knows it. But what David comes and he does right here is David just shows us how to skillfully write things. He does not, his, his, his poetry is not about cat see the rat his poetry is about thou art the greatest thou O lord thou hand be so i'm like david is david guys i don't know if you guys are hearing what i'm saying the bible comes and reveals to us when it says that david is also a mighty warrior when you see those attributes of david the bible says that david was the greatest fighting king to live the fact that when david steps in a battle the enemy already knows yeah, this guy is coming. The mighty David that killed the giant Goliath. And when you look at David's life, you understand that David had all of this amazing attributes to himself. The Bible went so far as to call David a man after God's own heart. I mean, if the Bible says it, then surely it should be true. That the Bible comes and God comes and he labels David and he says, this is a man after my heart. This is a man who understands my heartbeat. This is a man that pursues my presence. This is a man that knows my presence. This is a man that has an inclination to me. But throughout the series, we've been unpacking this, that there's a side to David that many do not necessarily speak of. That even though we had all of this great accolades above the cliff, the Bible shows us that beneath the water, it was quite rocky. Beneath the water, it was chaos. The, beneath the water, it was trouble. When we look at this, the Bible reveals to us that David was far from perfect. And I want you guys to go with me through this today as we're going to uh, share a bit about David and just finish off the series this morning. The Bible shows us that David was far from perfect. David comes to the place and he comes to a place. And that's why I remember the Bible is very beautiful in a sense that the, 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 the word of the Lord comes and it reveals to us, uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's a lot of poetry, so it's intentional stuff. When David saw Goliath, when he beat Goliath, what happened? Goliath's name became what happened to him. David saw Goliath, he said, go, Goliath. Some of you guys will get that next time. Long story short, you see, I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting, I want to walk around, but Father God, please just Lord, supernatural healing right now, Father. <laughs> 
What, what, what happens next? The Bible comes and reveals to us what happens next. The Bible says that David was in the wrong place. The Bible, Pastor Denver spoke about this last week, that David was supposed to go out in battle. But the Bible says that David re- decided to remain at home. And last week, Pastor Denver broke this down so beautifully. He said, the problem is the fact that many a times the enemy will attack you because you're not at the position you're supposed to be. So what happened is David comes to a place, he's supposed to go out and fight, but the Bible says he remains at home. And when he remains at home, he stands there and across the balcony, he sees a beautiful woman bathing. Isn't it funny that she was bathing and her name was Bathsheba. You guys see what the Bible's doing right there? So he saw Bathsheba bathing. So he comes in and he, he, he sees this woman there bathing. And all of a sudden, you guys know what David comes and he does. The Bible says here, he comes and he finds himself in the wrong position, wrong place at the right time. And sin comes crouching at his door. And what happens right here? He sees this woman from a mile away. He says, okay, could I want you. I want you bad, baby. I want you all to myself, love. And she's like, oh, yeah, I'm the king. I mean, what girl wouldn't react if the king wants you? Like, really now? And yes, she acts on himself and, 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 and David get together and everything happens. And the Bible says that Bathsheba eventually comes and she falls pregnant. And as she falls pregnant, the Bible says that David realized he's messed up because Bathsheba's actually married to a man called Uriah. What, has happen, what happens with Uriah? He comes and he realizes he's messed up and this woman just fall, fell pregnant. So what he then done is the Bible says that David went and called Uriah out of the battle. Just look at this, because guess what? The problem with sin is once you've sinned, you've got to do something to cover that up. It's like a lie. You guys know how difficult it is to lie. Most liars get caught up because they forget the lie they told before. Yeah. So what happens is he comes to a place, he lies with Bathsheba. He lies about Bathsheba. He brings Uriah out, sleep with your wife, please, man, just so that it, goes, it doesn't look like I'm guilty. And it's not, it, people will think it's your baby, not my baby. What, what then happens is Uriah goes out. The scriptures reveal that Uriah comes back home because he was out on the battlefield where David was supposed to be. The scriptures say that as Uriah came back and David recalls him, David says, why don't you just spend the night with your wife? You know, make sure you're with your wife and just go there. But Uriah understands this thing of a battle. He says, it does not make sense that my soldiers and my men are out there fighting for us as Israel. And I'm here and I'm enjoying myself with my wife. So what does Uriah do? He sleeps outside the temple. He says, I'm not going home because it's not right. David tries so badly to go far with this thing. David even makes Uriah drunk. He says, hey, give this guy, make him drunk, man. And Uriah, he sends Uriah home. Uriah still doesn't sleep with his wife. What then happens is Uriah ends up sleeping outside the house. He says, I will not. My men are out there. I'm supposed to be with them. I'm supposed to be doing all of this. Long story short, we find ourselves at a place now where David realizes that plan doesn't work. So what does he do? He tried lying, lying, lying. Comes to the third lie. Guess what happens? He now realizes that the only way that I can save myself from this misery is by killing Uriah. What he then does is he sends Uriah out on the battle. He tells his men that put Uriah in the front of the line of the battle where it's most fierce and where the enemy's greatest fighters are. And the moment the enemy comes in and attacks, you guys, us as Israel, retreats and you leave Uriah alone. So what happens? David sets up the murder plot for Uriah. David, a man after God's own heart. David guy who slayed Goliath, how? And, and when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, you guys know in Nigeria they say, David, oh, you know, da- David, oh, you know, and he comes to this place and the Bible says he goes out and he sets up Uriah at this particular time and the Bible, as Pastor Denver revealed last week, that he comes back to a place where Nathan comes in and he doesn't realize he, he thinks what he's done is right, but the Bible sends the prophet Nathan and he says, Nathan, go and this guy needs to know what he's done is wrong, but what I love about Nathan right here, and last week I told Pastor Denver, we should have a sermon called Watch Out for Your Nathan, except your Nathan, because Nathan is that person that will warn you, and many of us don't like warnings. So many a times before Somebody actually ends up committing the greatest sin. There's been warnings. The Bible sends Nathan to David and tells Nathan to go tell David that he sinned. But Nathan must put it in such a beautifully packaged way where he tells a story. The scriptures reveal that if he just went to David and said, Hey, Wena, you, you, we are Shania Wena. <laughs> you, you went and you killed this guy on battle. You have so many wives, but you wanted another man's wife. So he had to make a story about the king having a lot of sheep, but still when people came to visit, the king wanted to go fetch the slave sheep in order to feed the people. And he says, you have so many sheep. Why? And David got upset in this. He's like, how can a man do that? And then Nathan said, that was you. Took another man's wife. 
as you took another man's wife, what did you do? You slept with her and you had so many other women to choose from. Long story short, we find ourselves now at this. David then goes to the place where he says, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against God. I've messed up. I've messed up. He repents. The Bible says he sought reconciliation with God. But the thing here is, and this is where I'm going to with this morning's story. David sought repentance with God and reconciliation with God, but he never sought repentance and reconciliation with his own family. Sometimes we are in the place where our relationship with God is, you say, Father God, I ask you for forgiveness, but we don't understand the consequences of our sin that it might have on others. And that's where I'm going to be building the plot from this morning. And it's a bad place for anyone to fail that comes with your family. Seeds of failure sown. The moment we come to a place where we mess up in our sin, what happens is we sow a seed and this seed then starts multiplying itself because it's in the ground. What happens here? The Bible shows us, if you look at David's lineage, the Bible says that Ruth and Boaz years ago had a good, very good relationship, but not much was said about their son Obed. But Obed had a son named Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David. The Bible says when, when, when David was out in the fields and the prophet Samuel came to look for David, the scriptures reveal that David found himself in a position where his own father, Jesse, forgot about him. Imagine your own father forgetting about you forgetting that you actually had a son in the field there. And he said to Samuel, these are my sons. And Samuel said, no, there's one more son out there. So we find here that Jesse didn't consider David an equal to all his other sons. David wasn't treated with respect. David was, 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 was not only hard on David, but it's also not the best example that David had in order to be a father. Are we together? Are we together this morning? So when we look at this, we realize here that although David developed maturity and a good intimacy with God, it doesn't seem he ever accomplished this good intimacy and maturity with his family. He's characterized, his family was characterized by a lack of emotional intimacy. And here tomorrow, this morning, we are starting from Samuel 11. 2 Samuel 11. The Bible shows here that Sin will plant seeds of dysfunction. Sin will plant seeds of dysfunction. I've just mentioned now about David and Bathsheba and what happened here. The issue here is, how many of you guys believe we are living under grace? Can you put up your hand if you believe we're living under grace? Grace is beautiful, right? Grace is amazing, right? Grace is a gift to all of us. When we look at this thing called grace, Sometimes we don't understand that although God will forgive us, although God is gracious enough to forgive us of our sins, there are still consequences to our decisions. There are still consequences to the choice that you make. The devil does not make you sin. The devil gives you an option. You make the decision to sin. He came to Eve in the garden. He gave her an option. To this very day, he gives you an option. So what am I trying to say? It's the fact that you make the choice. And even though grace is there, which we all appreciate, there are still consequences. The Bible says here that when Nathan came to rebuke David of the fact that he slept with another man's wife and she fell pregnant, the Bible said here that um, Nathan told David, don't worry, David, you won't die. But the scriptures revealed to us that Nathan then told him that the Lord said that your baby is going to die. The baby that Bathsheba is carrying is, a, is going to die. And what was so interesting here is in that period after the word was released to David to say that the consequences of you sleeping with another man's wife means that the child that she's carrying is going to die. David went into a time of grieving, grieving and mourning. The Bible says he never ate for days. He was all alone by himself. He was in depression. And the scripture says seven days later that baby died. And when that baby died, David just got up and went on with life, life like nothing was wrong. But what was crazy about this is the fact that David never allowed his feelings of grief to surface. He stuffed his pain down and tried to ignore it. But what happened here, his emotional impact and the ignorance had an effect on the rest of his family. How? 
His children, how would his children even feel when they learned about the fact that my dad just committed adultery? My dad just committed murder. Imagine you had to go and reveal this to your kids, your other kids. Because remember, he had other wives. He had other kids by other wives. However, there was no open ground for communication. They had to follow David's example and bury their feelings. How many of us are sitting in families here this morning? We don't talk. We don't talk about our feelings. We don't talk about what is actually happening within. But the Bible says here, because David was the priest of his house, that those that example got carried over to the rest of his family. David dealt with sin be between him and God. But he never dealt with the sin between him and his family. When we're looking at this, dysfunction will end up repeating itself to the next generation. This function will end up repeating itself to the next generation. I think there's a scripture there that I've got with this. Where the Bible says in, in the book of Deuteronomy, the Bible reveals, it says that the sins of the forefathers will be passed down to the third and fourth generations. What is it trying to say here? Yeah, thou shalt not bow the, the, themselves or not serve them. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon their children unto the third and fourth generation to them that hate me. The Bible is trying to reveal to us in another translation that the wrongs of the fathers get passed down because dysfunction repeats itself in the next generation. How many of you guys in your family all don't talk about your issues? Where did it come from? Just track it down. Now you're also struggling to talk about your issues because the sins of your grandfather got passed down. And this is what the Bible says. This is the seriousness of it. It's the fact that God forgives your sins. Amen? But there's still consequences. So when we look at this, the family dysfunction often begins with the inability to handle emotion and tends to become more extreme as, as it passes down. So your grandfather might have just kept quiet. You are now starting to beat people up. Because it becomes worse as it passes down the lineage. The Bible says that David had an old, had, had, had David's oldest son's name was Amnon. Just look at this. Because of how messed up it was, David had an elder son named Amnon, and Amnon was sexually attracted to his stepsister Tamar. Yeah. The Bible says... It, 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 how many of you guys watched that Oster? Scandal? What other soapies are there? How many what other soapies? Aaron's Flay. What other soapies are there? Cock. I heard, I heard a new one there. <laughs> Guys, the story of David is... This is the worst drama I've read in... in oh, I thought this drama I'm watching on TV is bad. But this drama in David's family is messed up. It is ridiculous. You guys, I'm sure if they made a story out of this, all of us would be hooked. We'll come to church the next week. Hey, Muna, did you hear what David done? <laughs> Don, Muna, Ebnon and sister... <laughs> Since when, you know what, it's, it's, it's drama, now you speak when you get your people, did you guys watch what happened, we can't wait, and then they show the upcoming next, next week, and then you see the people come out and they act and they say, oh, I can't wait to watch, to watch tomorrow, this is what the story is about, this is what the story is basically, the Bible says that Amnon was sexually attracted to his own stepsister, because it was David's other wife that, so it, it says it, it, it was, he was obsessed with her, and what was so crazy here is that in the same way, David had planned to manipulate circumstances so he could lust after another man's wife without facing consequences. Amnon planned the same thing with his stepsister. David done the thing to another man's wife. The next generation comes, it gets worse. The Bible says that Amnon comes and he plans to sleep with his stepsister. He plans the exact same thing. The Bible says that Amnon manipulated his father. You know how? As Amnon, he pretended to be sick. So what did he do when he pretended to be sick? He told his father, please ask my sister Tamar to bring me the best food. And when he asked my sister Tamar to bring the best food, Tamar comes and she brings it. And here he grabs her and he says, you're going to sleep with me. And she says, how can you do this? The people are going to despise us and make us feel, make me, I'm going to be sh I'm in shame. I'm going he says, I don't care. He sleeps with her. And you know what's crazy here? As he sleeps with her and he's done, all of a sudden the Bible says hatred bursts up in his heart towards her. His own stepsister. He goes and he sends his stepsister away because she was still a virgin. 
the scriptures reveal she had a robe on and because he raped her, her robe was torn. And when the robe was torn, it was full of blood and she had to run out and run away and everybody saw her. The scriptures say her blood brother, Absalom, sees this and says, what is wrong with my sister? He sees his sister crying, but his sister doesn't say anything, but Absalom knows something is wrong here. But what happened here is he then comes to the place where he ends up hating and blaming his very own stepsister as if it was her fault. Have you guys seen those six psychopaths that were on the one moment they want to sleep, the next moment they all of a sudden they hate you because they got what they wanted. The Bible says, as would be expected, Tamar was devastated. But the brother Absalom saw, um, and when, when he saw something was off, the Bible shows here that the problems, the issues and stuff got buried again. Started by David, comes here to Absalom and Tamar them. And the son, they end up bearing all of these issues. They pretended like everything was fine. But in fact, the Bible says that Absalom responded to Tamar's desolation. Instead of giving her a hug and some reassurance that justice would be done, he told her in effect not to take it seriously because it's going to make the family. You guys know those family matters. Don't say anything to your father. It's going to mess up the family. It's gonna make you, how many of you guys have secrets in your family? Be real. Secrets that no one knows about. And if somebody had to say it, then to remember that then, then, then your auntie would come. It's going to mess things up. It's exactly what's happening here. The scriptures reveal here that David eventually finds out that his very own son, Amnon, raped his daughter. He's upset, but he does nothing about it. He does not even comfort his daughter or enforce God's law. Because God's law at that particular time meant that he had to send his son out into exile. Or stone him. The Bible shows us here when what happens because the next portion here is unresolved pain will go underground. On the surface, everything seemed nice. Such a loving family. The king, they have money. Everything's working out. But beneath, a storm was raging. The Bible says here, David was furious because Tamar's life was ruined. Amnon ended up hating the very sister he raped. Absalom, Tamar's brother, ended up hating his brother Amnon. As in dysfunctional families, these feelings do not lessen as time passes, but they grow. What happens here, after two years of denial, Absalom moves into a stalemate. He approaches his father. He says, let's get the whole family together just to celebrate it. But David says he's not going to go there. So what happens? Perfect shot. Absalom gets all his brothers and his sisters and the entire family together. He plots and he kills Amnon. One brother killing the other brother. The Bible says here, and it reveals to us that David was so grieved that Absalom killed his other son, Amnon. He ends up sending Absalom into exile. And he says, you will stay out of the kingdom. Absalom goes and stays by his mother's father, his grandfather's feeling, and nothing else was done. But what we see is often dysfunctional families comes in and they see that one rebel doesn't play by the rules. So you know what was sad here? It's the fact that Absalom ended up becoming the black sheep of the family. Because he retaliated on something his father didn't want to deal with. The story comes and reveals to us that Absalom became this. And for three years that Absalom was in exile, David did not allow his own son to return. Because David himself never dealt with the issues in the beginning. This so impacted him that Absalom even named his own daughter Tamar. Because he had learned from his father how not to correctly deal with grief. Finally, the Bible says David allowed Absalom to return from exile in Jerusalem. But Absalom had to really force the issue finally back after two years to get to see his father. Because even though he was in his father's kingdom, he wasn't allowed to come into the temple. The scriptures reveal to us that Absalom found himself in a place where he was still upset with his dad. Dad, you had to do something about this. Dad, you had to protect your daughter. You had to protect my sister. But you've done nothing. And because of that, Absalom then goes and he starts plotting against his own father. David's own son plotting against him. 
The scripture says that Absalom goes to the, the beginning of the city at the gate. And as people come, because there was no judge, people come to Absalom and Absalom says, don't worry, the king won't hear your cry. And the people start respecting Absalom because Absalom gives the people advice and wisdom and the people bow before Absalom. You know what he does? He then goes out with the people, he recruits a whole lot of people and he starts rebelling against his father's kingdom. And I'm looking at this with the fact that dysfunction destroys. Dysfunction destroys. Somebody say dysfunction destroys. Dysfunctional families are nothing. But what's so crazy about this is the fact that David found himself where he had public success, but private failure. I'm going to say it again. Public success, but private failure. Was it Absalom's fault to be born into the family under David? Was it Amnon's fault to be born into a family like that? Was it your fault to be born into your family? Some of you guys might say, yo, I wish I had a dad like David slaying Goliath. But after reading this story, some of you would be like, yo, ha, ha. <laughs> Let me think twice before asking for a dad like this. What I'm trying to say is you never asked to be born into your family. But what we see here is the fact that everything looked good above. The fact that David had intimacy with God, but he neglected intimacy with his children. Intimacy with his family. What we see here is that dysfunction has far-lasting consequences. Instead of facing problems, dysfunctional family members cover them up and manipulate situations. And that's why I'm speaking about this because the Bible shows us, I believe the story of David should be 18, RSVP, what, what, PG, what, it's on that level. Because the Bible, and that's why I love the Bible so much, God comes in and he reveals to us the good, the bad, and the ugly. He doesn't just reveal to us the good things about these men of God in the word. But what we see here is that God wants to bring us to a place where he says that I don't want you to have public success and then in the private you are failing. I don't want you to be in a place where online you can post a picture and you get over 100 likes. And 1,000 people loving you online. And people saying, I want to be like you. But in the private, you are privately dying. I don't want you to be in a place where you are pretending like everything's fine up there. But beneath the surface, you are struggling. God is saying and he's giving the story to us of David to show us you can have all of these amazing things. But in the background, you are breaking. And God is revealing, he says, yes, he's a man after my own heart. But his dysfunction has cost him. Him not being willing to talk about his issues and his problems has cost him. Him not opening up and saying how his feelings has cost him. Him deciding to sleep with another man's wife has cost him. How many of us are sitting in those situations? You found out later on you had another stepbrother somewhere. Where you never realized why your dad is so cold towards you. Where your dad might have left you and your family went to go live with another family. Those kids get spoiled and you don't. Public success. Everybody loves him because he has money. But in the private, your family is breaking. Because of all the secrets. Because of all the secrets. What happens here is because of the psychometric illnesses in dysfunctional families, they are worse. Just check a child who struggles with asthma. He'll get more frequent asthma attacks because his family unit in the house is not in the way it should be. Then that child who grows in a house that has asthma and doesn't have family issues. Because of stress. Pain avoided or denied in dysfunctional families. The Bible says David denied his and it ended up with the abuse of his children. Relational boundaries are broken. Amnon felt it wasn't wrong for him to go and sleep with his very own sister. He never understood the boundaries. Emotional reactions instead of a healthy response. We see Amnon finding himself into a place and David where they react emotionally. I'm revealing these things to us this morning, family. 
to say, God doesn't want you to shine on the outside and on the inside you are broken. God doesn't want you to be in the place where you feel like everything above. If you, I don't know if you guys know an iceberg. If you look at an iceberg on top, it looks big, but at the bottom there's actually a greater. Now many of us live our lives in such a way where we pretend things are fine up on top. But David being in the wall of floor comes in and reveals to us that even though we had all of these great accolades, killing Goliath, a skilled musician, a poet, the Bible reveals a third of the Psalms is Psalms of lamenting. A third of the Psalms is David asking for forgiveness and repentance before the Lord. But he finds himself here in a place that because of one decision he's, he's made, he's still facing the consequences of it generations later. When God brought this into our lives in regards to sin, grace is there. But some of us right now are suffering the consequences of our own decisions. And as Pastor Denver said last week, we're going to blame the devil for everything. The devil gave an option. We made the decision. But God is saying, do not be like David this morning. God is saying, stop trying to be a public success, but in the private, you can't deal with your things. God is saying, be in the place where you must start talking about what's hurting you. God wants you to start opening up about the dysfunctions that's currently happening within your household. And men, I'm talking to you this morning as well. That we need to man up and take responsibility for our families. The Bible reveals this in this way. where The Bible says that because of the sins of the forefathers, three to four generations end up suffering. But also, if we do not get to the place where we open up about this, the Bible says it gets worse as it passes down. How many of our family members do we know today are struggling with drugs? Are struggling with alcohol abuse? He's struggling with sexual abuse. He's struggling with all of these things because of family dysfunctions. But you know what? The saddest part of this, we've been trying to normalize dysfunction. That's just how my family is. That's just how we are. We've been normalizing dysfunction that in this house, we just don't talk about our problems. In this house, we just don't talk about our issues. In this house, we just don't tackle those things. In this house, it's silent treatment. In this house, oh, we don't want to make my dad upset because now, now he's going to lose a casket and he's going to flip on us. We've been trying to normalize dysfunction and the enemy wants you to live in dysfunction because he wants you to live apart from the blessing of God. Even though on the surface it looked nice, the Bible says beneath they were dying. God says do not be the kind of Christian that when you are on top it looks all beautiful. But at the bottom the Bible says you are not rooted. You are not rooted in God. God says I do not want a Christianity that is fake. A Christianity that pretends, a Christianity that pretends that everything is fine, but at the bottom, you are actually dying. We've tried to normalize dysfunctions. Whenever I get upset, I'll do what I want to. But God is in the place where God says, man of God, woman of God. I can only bless the true you. I can only bless the you whom I've seen. But this journey is not just a journey between yourself and God. You know what I'm saying this morning? Family, your decisions hurt others. Your decisions hurt other people. Your decisions has consequences. And we need to be responsible believers and responsible Christians when it comes to what we decide. If I make a decision right now, my entire family gets affected by this. Your decision carries weight. It's not just the fact that you need to ask God for forgiveness. But some of you this morning needs to go and ask your family for forgiveness. Ask your mother or your father for forgiveness because of the decision you've made. Your decision carry lasting consequences. And one day you're going to ask yourself, why is this happening? Because of a decision I made 10, 15 years ago. And God is saying, be rooted. But he's looking for genuine. He's not looking for the you that comes to church and pretends like all is fine. He's looking for the you that says, Father, I'm broken. 
just like the Apostle Paul, oh Lord, what a wretched man I am. Who can save me from my misery? But he says, oh, only the Lord Jesus Christ who brought my salvation. Only Jesus can save this wreck of a man. And sometimes we need to be honest with ourselves. We don't have it all together. Sometimes some of you guys today are suffering the consequences of the decisions your father made. David's father wasn't loving towards him. He ended up not being loving towards his own children. David's father never cared about him to deal with the issues. David done exactly the same thing. But I'm mentioning this this morning so that all of us can understand our decisions as Christians has consequences. You know what grace loves? You know what grace does? Grace enables us to deal with them better. That's what I'm grateful about. I don't know about you. Grace enables us to deal with it better. But we still have to deal with the consequences. It's not the fact that we are afraid God's going to punish us. God's forgiven us. But there's consequences to our own decisions that we still have to face up to. God is saying this morning that just as David and his family was messed up. Some of us sitting here are sitting in pretty messed up situations in our families. Who can relate with me with this one? Who can, do I have some honest Christians here this morning? Right? I'm not speaking to my father. My family can't even sit around the table and discuss things. My relationship with my siblings. How many of you guys are not speaking to your sisters or your brothers? Because of this dysfunctions. We've tried to normalize dysfunction. No, we're not speaking for over 10 years. But God is saying there are certain blessings in your life that is being withheld because you're not settling and dealing with your problems. Have the bravery to sit down and not just, because the Bible says when you confess to God, you will forgive. But when you confess to others, you will be healed. You know what I'm saying this morning? God's, when you confess to God, He forgives you. The Bible says, but confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. The reason why some of you are still not healed is because you've not confessed your sins to one another. You've only confessed them to God. And God is saying this morning, make right. Speak. If you need a witness, if you need a church leader to come with you and speak with you in your family circles or at home, as you share it or you share your things, let us know. We'll be there with you every step of the way. But God is saying, I don't want my children living in dysfunction. I don't want my children living with issues beneath the surface, even though they might be shining on top. I'm yet to tell you, those things are going to come get you. It might not be now, it might be 10 years from now, but these things always come lurking back. David not dealing with this situation with Bathsheba meant that his children had to suffer the consequences where murder and rape took place, where his own son hated him, only if he started speaking. If there's anyone this morning that you say, Pastor, I need prayer. I feel that we've been trying to normalize dysfunction in my family. We've been trying to normalize dysfunction when it comes to work things, that certain things are not in place. And I realize I'm not walking in the full blessing of God, but I'm also not walking in full healing. And I need God's forgiveness and God's grace. Upon this journey, I want you just to stand up this morning. If that is you this morning, I want you just to stand up. If there's anyone, I want you just to be open, be honest with yourself with where you might find yourself. If that is you, I want you just to lift up your hands. If you're feeling a bit afraid, it's fine. Let us let us all just bow our hands, our heads. It's quite a serious thing. Nobody is looking at you. If you know that your family is struggling with these things, I want you just to lift up your hand this morning. With dysfunctions, with issues, with things that needs to be dealt with. Amen. Now we see the hands. Amen. Father, this morning, I come before you, thanking you for your goodness, your mercy, your grace, your kindness. Father God, I pray for courage, strength, to deal with the dysfunctions 
that we don't deal with. Some of us are walking in the decisions of our forefathers, our parents, our grandparents with what they've made and now we are suffering. But I pray that we will make decisions today, Father God, that will stop this dysfunctions from passing down from the next generation. We pray that there are people putting up their hand right now that says, Lord, it stops with me. It stops with me today. We will not allow this to be passed on to my children or the next generation. I pray that it stops with me today. I ask, Lord God Almighty, that this morning that you may heal their hearts, that you may give them the courage not just to speak to you, but to speak to those who might have hurt them. To speak to those that might be in dysfunction. To speak to those whose decisions have caused turmoil within their lives. I pray, Lord God Almighty, that the first step to this is forgiveness. That they will release them. That they will release them, Lord God Almighty, and that they will forgive them. I pray that you may give your people boldness to deal with these issues. That we stop trying to say, no, that's just how we are. That's just how my family is. That's just how we do things. But it's not in accordance to your word. I pray that the life of David may be an example to us of how to do things, but also how not to do things. I pray that we will make decisions and understand, Lord God, that we may have the boldness to face them if they are wrong. But we know with your grace you will allow us and help us to overcome. But I pray that you'll also give us the boldness to be obedient to you. That Father, the reason why your word is there is to guide us. So that we may make decisions that brings glory and honor to you. And everything we do may bring glory and honor to you. That when we make decisions that honor you, that the blessings now get passed down to the next generation. That when I make a decision for the God to say that the decision I'm making right now will bring a blessing bestowed upon my children. I'll bring my children up in a house of peace because of the decision I've made to follow you. I'll bring my family up in a house that loves you because of the decision I've made to follow you. I'll make sure, Lord God, that love is displayed upon my friendship circles because of a decision I've made to follow you. I pray that whatever we make that brings glory and honor to you, that we will see the fruit thereof. Above this, Lord God, I pray for believers and individuals to be rooted in your word. That we may not normalize dysfunction. That we may not normalize dysfunction. That we may not live and try to have public success but private failure. May we not go after the likes and the comments and the accolades and things outside there. But on the inside we are slowly losing it. But may we be people that works hard in the private. That works hard to make sure in the private we are successful in honoring you. That when we appear in the public, that you will allow us to shine because you will get the glory. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Come on, let's just give the Lord a shout of praise this morning. This is not an I bless you message. Yes, I. This is a message that if we get this right, the next generations will reap the blessings of our decisions here today. This is a message where people won't see the decision you've made. Does it make sense? No one's going to go and post this evening. Me and my family decided to sit around the table and talk out our problems. Who's going to post that? You know, we actually had real issues going on here. I never spoke to my sister for years, but now we just came to a place and we made. No, no, no I was going to post that. I want us to be believers of integrity. That we'll talk about these things and work so much harder on these things and the accolades. I got my degree. Oh yeah, I'm shining. <laughs> let's, make, let's work harder on things unseen than those things seen. And tell me again of the blessing that will be revealed and poured out over your life. Amen. Believers that are rooted, believers of integrity, believers that serve God in, in their quiet time, that's not too worried about the spotlight. God looks at that at the position of your heart. And he will bless that and others will wonder.